Joining us once again on the program is Mr. Money Mustache. He runs the personal finance blog, uh, MrMoneyMustache.com. It's great to have you back. Let's start there. Do you call it a, a personal finance blog? I know it's in that category, broadly speaking, or do you call it something else? I still like to call it a personal finance blog because uh, a lot of people go out looking for personal finance blogs, and that's what this one is about. It's about fixing your monetary situation in order to have a better life. It's just that once the people get there, we trick them into not wanting to spend their money anymore, which is actually the secret way to get wealthy. All right. So after you were on the program last time, to kind of recap, last time we talked about how people should kind of think about their daily expenditures in a different way. We talked about the formula for figuring out, hey, if I'm spending $15 a week on coffees, what does that really add up to over five years or 10 years of my life if I take into consideration the interest I would have earned had I saved that money instead? Invariably, as you get on your blog after your appearance, I got a ton of emails saying, listen, this mustache guy was interesting, but he's basically advocating just taking out all the pleasures in life. Uh, what, who cares if, if two times a week I want to get a coffee at Starbucks and it's a five dollar coffee and I get enjoyment out of that? What's wrong with that? Now, do you have a specific thought? I know you get these emails all the time. Broadly, how do you respond to people who, who have that point of view? Yeah, we call those uh, <clears throat> those emails complainy pants emails as a broad category. And uh, but really, it's uh, it's a valid thing. I mean, of course, you should be seeking out the happiness in your life. Uh, my big argument, though, is that um, I think when you when you think that your happiness is coming from coffees or dinners or like a BMW instead of a Corolla, I think you've been fooled. You know, that's that's not really where the source of happiness is. But if you've just grown up your whole life watching TV, you've been programmed to think that. And there's a much better way to live, which is just to erase that whole bit of programming that you got from the ads and figure out what really makes you happy. And there's a much deeper layer of stuff that does that. You know, for example, having having good friends and being close to family and being generous to people and just getting out and enjoying the world and nature and learning is a big thing for me. I'm a lot happier learning than I am consuming. So if you find that you think your happiness is coming from buying stuff, you got to dig deeper and work on it because you can be happy, you know, living on a beach in uh, in the tropics with bare feet, just having coconuts and a beautiful canoe to go fish from. You know, that's been happy. People have been happy doing that in the past. And you can, too. Of course, you don't have to do that, but just just totally separate this whole idea of spending is what makes you happy. So let's use me as an example here, because I don't find myself someone who is kind of obsessed with the consumer culture. I think about every purchase and say, does this really make sense? I don't buy it right away. I wait. I say, do if I still feel like I need this, then I'll reconsider purchasing it. You know, I have a car with with good gas mileage, all of these things. I have friends. I enjoy learning. I like the outdoors. However, most of the week I work either in my office studio or just at home at my desk. Once or twice a week, I like to on my half day off, take my laptop to a coffee shop, get a two dollar and fifty cent drink and just sit there with my laptop and do my work there. I don't go every day. I otherwise don't get these five dollar coffee drinks. Even is is that even excessive? Or if I've evaluated and said within the broader context of my spending, that makes sense to me. Is that OK or do I still need to change my priorities? I think you don't have to change your priorities. It's just a matter of being aware. So the way you describe that is the uh, the description of a very aware person who is not going to get themselves into financial trouble. And, you know, in a, in a country like the United States, there's so much money to go around. You know, even if you're making twenty thousand dollars a year, that's enough for plenty of food. You can have a place to live. You know, you, you can have a lot, a lot of luxuries in that, you know, and as you go up, you can afford more and more. So really what you have to do is just watch out for getting over the top. And most people are just seriously over the top. As an example, buying a car when you don't even have the cash in the bank to pay for that car outright is an example of extreme behavior. But it's, it's so common that people think it's normal. They think car loans are normal in this country, which is completely like a financial, like, whoo, it's just, it's ridiculously terrible way to manage your money. But it is common. So you got to separate the coffees from from the car loans and and it all scales according to how well you're doing in other areas of your life. If you have credit card debt and you're paying 24 percent on it, then no, you can't even get one coffee. You know, you got to be eating like oats and uh, potatoes and that's it, you know, until the emergency of your debt is done. But there's all kinds of levels of, of reasonableness.
So speaking of reasonableness, let's talk about Black Friday with you because it just so happens we just had this crazy start to the holiday uh, a buying season on Friday called Black Friday. Earlier in the show, we had the videos of people stampeding at Walmart and this entire thing. I've told stories from when I worked at the now defunct Circuit City when I was in high school and I used to have to work Black Friday sometimes in the morning. Now, then it wasn't nearly as crazy as it is now. Whenever I hear about Black Friday, the one thing that sticks in my mind is the following. When people are talking about how much they've saved, it assumes they had to buy those products. They should be thinking, no, 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 I've spent X amount, not I've saved X amount. It, why does nobody think that way? That's true. Well, it's because they've probably been programmed to think that buying at a discount is the same thing as saving. I think saving is a measure of how much you've grown your investment account, how much you've contributed to, for example, your 401k or your other investment accounts at the end of the month. That's what saving is. Um, buying stuff is totally different. A Black Friday sale might be good. Like, for example, if you think right now, what do I need? And you write it down. And if you still want it by next Black Friday, 2014, then it's probably a good idea to, to get it on sale at that point. But if you're just going out to say, uh, let's see what's on sale, and you go into the stores and you say, oh, wow, discount on the Nexus 11 and all this stuff, that's... Uh, that's not really saving money. It's just creating wants that you didn't have before the sale came up. So and that's really what the, the kind of consumer culture is about, right? Which is let's create a uh, let, first let's create demand and then let's create these false discounts, which Wall Street Journal has widely shown uh, Black Friday sales are often marked up over the three months that go before it. So then you create a higher uh, retail price off of which you can create a discount. This is all common retail tactics. And then once you've created that demand, you create urgency, right? Is this basically the mechanism? First, the demand, then the urgency to act right now. That sounds like a reasonable technique. You know, I've never been Black Friday, Friday shopping, um, so I didn't even know all the tricks that they do. I just kind of stay out of the whole scene and it's a nice place to be. I just went out actually yesterday. I spent the whole or on fr Black Friday, spent the whole day just biking around town and building some uh, parts of the new house I'm working on renovating and, uh, and then the whole thing came and went and there was no lineups. So I didn't even know that there was Black Friday. All right. So the last thing I want to ask you about it, it, this also relates to emails that I got after your last appearance. When you talk about and you write about this extensively on your blog, how twenty thousand dollars in the United States is more than enough money to live comfortably. When people invariably say the job I have is in an area with a much higher cost of living in order to live with twenty thousand dollars a year, I would need to move. Is your response, well, yeah, everybody should move out of those expensive areas? It should be an option. I think it's a great to, um, if you're going to live in an expensive area, usually those prices are high because the salaries are high. So you should get one of those salaries that, that justifies living there or consider moving. Um, of course, there's other, th other stuff like family and friends to consider. But uh, yeah, you should never think of your living situation as fixed. As soon as you open up your mind to moving, all kinds of stuff can happen. Like you can suddenly live within walking or biking distance of work. You can live in a place where property taxes are almost no, none, but yet you get great city services and, and a high salary. Like the place that I live here in Colorado is, is like that. So yeah, just keep your mind open for for a diff and and you can also live in expensive places cheaply. I get I get letters from New Yorkers and Silicon Valley people who have these amazing like two thousand dollar a month lifestyles just by being innovative, like figuring out who to live with and where to shop and what to do after work. All right, I don't know why he's just like a friendly guy, but he's very controversial every time he's on the show. People must actually be listening to the content of what you're saying because every time it's just crazy. And it's the same thing on your blog. People just get very agitated when you tell them these things. I don't know about that. If you look at the comments section of my blog, the uh, the complainers have mostly been scared away. Oh, they have. Okay, that's good. So much that people accuse us of being a freaky cult where everybody just agrees with each other. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I can't wait till it's like minus 10 tomorrow and I can ride my bike with 100 pounds of groceries up the hill because it'll be, it'll be a big challenge. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the way the blog's uh, readership has become these days. And I think it's great. It's a way, you know, people feed off each other and get inspired to live more rugged and, you know, high effort lives. All right, Mr. Money Mustache, check out his website. I'm a reader, MrMoneyMustache.com. Thanks again for being on. All right, thanks for the invitation.